I think that that I probably felt I could have handled the pain better, but I think the pain is also inevitable. I mean, we all know that pain is the price that we pay for love, and if we're going to love anybody, there will be deep pain. I, I mean, there's no way around it. Welcome back to Crisis What Crisis, the podcast that aims to guide you towards a more resilient life and whatever it might throw at you. If this is your first time with us, then please hit subscribe wherever you're watching or listening. It really helps make sure that these, I hope, useful conversations are shared as widely as possible. My guest today is someone who can give us perspectives on crisis from a number of different, I think, very valuable angles. First and foremost, as one of Britain's most eminent and progressive educators, Sir Anthony Selden, has pioneered approaches as a headmaster designed to arm our young people for life's challenges. Long before resilience became fashionable as a topic in our schools, Anthony was introducing radical programs to help his pupils lead, as he puts it, I think rather brilliantly, smarter and more salted lives. That work, for reasons that I'm interested to explore, has not always been welcomed by the educational establishment. As a young man himself, Anthony became derailed with flunk day levels and personal problems, including heavy drinking and anxiety. The answer to those challenges, at least in part, came from discovering a passion to teach driven by a work ethic that will put most of us to shame. Aside from the day jobs he's held, including as master at Wellington and Brighton Colleges and vice-chancellor at Buckingham University, Sir Anthony is a renowned author and political historian. He's written over 40 books on contemporary history, politics and education, including political biographies of Tony Blair, David Cameron, Theresa May, and most recently, Boris Johnson. That book in particular, giving a deeply critical analysis of Boris's time in government. A co-founder of the charity Action for Happiness, uh, Anthony was knighted in the 2014 birthday honours for his services to education and modern political history. Aside from resilience and happiness, grief is also a subject that Anthony has strong views on, views forged from personal experience. In 2016, he lost his wife of 34 years, Joanna, five years after she was diagnosed with a rare cancer. He said that those final years together were among the happiest he ever had, like falling in love all over again. Anthony's clear-sighted, ultimately positive approach to how we should prepare for life's most difficult moments has never been more tested or been more critical than with the task he now has as headmaster at Epsom College a school and community still in trauma following the murder in February of headmistress Emma Patterson and her seven-year-old daughter Letty by her husband. Sir Anthony Seldom, welcome to Crisis What Crisis. How are you? Well, nice to be here. Thank you. Looking forward to it. Um, Anthony, on Epsom, um, it's important, I think, that we make clear that this podcast is absolutely not the forum for you to discuss in any detail. Uh, what happened there. I know the inquest is upcoming and this is an especially sensitive time. In general terms though, you've made clear that your job is to secure Emma's legacy, to make sure that her amazing work is remembered and continues. C can I ask you, how do you, you know, approach that task with a, a school, a community that, as I say, must be in such trauma? But well, I think in the way that we all should approach crises and trauma, which is not to become engulfed in it. Uh, becoming engulfed in, in loss uh, doesn't uh, pay service to the person, the people who've gone. Catastrophizing it uh, doesn't help anybody. Uh, one has to be optimistic, one has to be uh, forward thinking, and one has to pull together. And crises, whether the eternal crises in Downing Street, which have sunk uh, many of the 57 premierships to date and counting uh, of the Prime Minister's office, or in the life of a school or a corporate life, uh, it is the crises that are the test of, of the fibre 
of those organizations. So by applying uh, what I've learned in life personally, but also from positive psychology, the, uh, the great uh, work of uh, uh, Martin Seligman, the under-known, under-acknowledged person who could inform every single government. I did bring him into Downing Street, by the way. Mm. Um, and, uh, and company, uh, and make them simply better. Um, but also, I think, by my own religious faith. Uh, so those things, a mixture of those. You've written that you ask yourself often in this in this job, um, this you know, difficult task, what would Emma do as you deal with those challenges? So there's legacy is, is an important piece also. Yeah, we have to build from where we were um, and taking the premierships again, a reason why we've had eight premierships in a row that have underperformed is that each of those prime ministers come in and they think that they need to annul, negative, besmirch, uh, destroy the reputation of their predecessors. Mm. No, every intelligent leader, uh, even where that leader maybe wasn't uh, particularly successful, finds the strengths within it and builds on it. There's something unattractive and, and undignified about not building are uh, on uh, the legacy of what's gone before. You find the good in the past, like every good leader will find the good in people in the present. Um, Anthony, let's talk about why it is that you spent so much of your time, your career as an educator, focused on mental health. Is it, is it can I ask, that your own struggles that I touched on in that, in that intro that spark that passion? I was put on... Um, at a very early age, I was put on a forerunner of Valium um, and there was something called Librium, there was something called Sermon Till or something to help me sleep because my sleeping was rubbish. What sort uh, of age are you at this Oh, this I was put on, I think, 16. Right. Uh, and then I just discovered this was just gumming up my mind as I went through A-levels. So at uh, uni, genius, uh, I realised that uh, two pints of, uh, uh, of bitter um, drunk at 10 o'clock when I was at the age where it doesn't, alcohol doesn't mean you have to get up and pee in the middle of the night or indeed wake you up, you know, was, was the most brilliant sedative. But, you know, then after uni, I just didn't want to carry on in this way. One of my close friends now dead from alcoholism you carried on drinking and I then turned to meditation and yoga and found within those uh, the ability to find an inner calm that wasn't reliant upon either uh, numbing, gumming the mind up with uh, sedatives and tranquilizers or indeed with, with alcohol. And so, you know, th that, you know, that led me to think, how do we what can we do to, to teach agency, uh, to help young people recognize that they do have choices? They don't have to uh, uh, become overwhelmed any more than any organization has to become overwhelmed when you have a disaster, a crisis. Mm. Uh, this is uh, the fabulous opportunity to test uh, the resources to do the three things I talked about at the beginning. Mm. Um, and I, I believe this. I believe that it's about working at the top of the waterfall. And yet the government still today, um, uh, with a new crisis, uh, um, uh, suicide uh, strategy, it's too much about, um, it's too much about uh, uh, helping people once the problems occur, rather than building the capacity, the heart of every education at school should be the building of capacity so we help young people learn how to live. You know, look, getting nice GCSEs and A-levels is great, uh, but it's not the end of the story. Uh, and getting a good Ofsted report, you know, is nice, but it's not the end of the story. What really matters is, is the institution doing a good job in helping young people learn how to live meaningful, <laughs> contented, uh, productive, enjoyable lives without dependencies uh, and without uh, the need to, to trash themselves. Recognising some people will find that more difficult than others, but everyone can learn. So I think that's it. Can you pinpoint the moment in your life when, I mean, was it a moment or was it a gradual, one imagines it must have been a sort of gradual process for you 
uh, the sort of you know re reopening of your mind after that period, if you like, or, or that ability to sort of see the world in a different way. Is there a moment? Is there an individual? Uh, yeah. Is there a conversation uh, that you would point to? Okay. So after university, I went to the London School of Economics and wrote a doctorate. Now, postgrad work is is very lonely, particularly postgrad research. And I did find it very difficult and went off to America as part of my research. I was writing about uh, government and I was researching in the archives of Presidents Eisenhower and Truman. And I was miles from anywhere I knew. And I just suddenly crashed in and I just uh, came the closest I've ever done to having a breakdown and managed somehow to get back to the UK and determined... I was going to try and live a life that was. Give us, give us a, give us a, a, a bit more colour, if you don't mind, on what that, what uh, that, what Middle of the what, night, what that... I was in a seedy motel uh, in uh, a place called Independence, Missouri, on I seventy. Andy, if you want to get down to, um, to, 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 to details, <laughs> name of the interstate <laughs> highway. And I suddenly woke woke up. You're in your shots. you're in your early twenties. Yeah, were gun yeah. Oh yeah, sorry. Yeah. I was I was uh, early mid early early twenties. Yeah. Uh, there were gunshots in the middle of the night, and I just thought, where am I? Uh, and um, I thought nothing in my fantastic uh, schooling and and university had helped me uh, prepare me to to manage on my own in a totally alien environment, and. It made me genuinely feel, for myself, I had to get myself, my own house in order, but then want to try to help young people uh, learn the skills of, of self-accomplishment, self-confidence, so that they can uh, ground themselves on something other than just their exam results, which is, to be honest, all that the government uh, cares about uh, for, for, from... Uh, from schools and uh, mm. let everything else uh, go hang. Uh, and until they recognise th and understand what the word education means, I mean, I've never met a government minister who knows what the word education means. It means drawing out, leading out of what's inside you. Until they learn that it means leading out of your emotional intelligence, your creative intelligence, your, um, your, your interpersonal intelligence, your ability... Uh, to, to, to understand yourself and to know what you want in life and what you're good at, um, we won't have a satisfactory education system and we'll continue to fail a third of our young people as the current education system does. So um, it was from very lonely, bitter experience and I learned how to uh, meditate. I'm still learning, by the way. Um, and doing yoga. I still do yoga twice a day, uh, 45 years on. I stand on my head twice a day uh, and do various exercises. And with that goes uh, being thoughtful about hydration and what you eat and exercise uh, in a way that's not selfish. It's, it's not great to, 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 to be dependent uh, on others and, and to not look after your body. Looking after your body is uh, looking after your mind, uh, as any parent knows for their children, uh, is a valuable part of life. I mean, life's about more than that, but that's a valuable part of life. Mm. So all these things go to with what makes um, a teacher and always the, the, the great kids were those who struggled and found difficulty. Uh, uh, and you can make a transformative difference. Is there an individual that you look back on who helped? I mean, who steered you toward meditation out of interest? Was that self-discovery or did... Or well, did... Um, uh, the individual who most affected me was an English teacher at school who, when I uh, was invited to leave the school for organising a demonstration... You were invited to leave the school? I'm putting that... Um, <laughs> Uh, I'm putting that optimistically. It's all about optimism. Uh, it was suggested that, that maybe my future would be better, that both the school, certainly the school, uh, yeah. and me would be better in, in, in different geographic positions. Uh, but I didn't use the E word. No. Um, and uh, no. Uh, and it's, it's a terrible thing to expel somebody. I know that. Mm. I've done it, and, and I, I, it 
it always deeply troubles me. But I was allowed back, and this person, the English teacher, went on to write a novel about my grandparents, became very close to him, huge influence, made me come into teaching. He's called Jonathan Smith, a great writer. Um, and uh, uh, and then another great figure I met very early on called John T. Driver, who was an anti-apartheid campaigner, uh, put in solitary confinement in South Africa, died just the other day, a writer and a poet, mm. who then became a head themselves. I mean, you know, we all have these significant, important people uh, in our in our lives. They were mine, uh, and cling on to them uh, because they are our load stars. And um, for for meditation, I think it was just more an inner sense. I've always felt an attraction towards uh, religion um, and uh, the sense of a spiritual reality underpinning all of life. Um, and that helped me. Uh, and bit by bit, uh, I changed. I then met or re-met, actually, a remarkable woman called Joanna, who I'd met at university, uh, who thought I was a pretentious git uh, and who wore black all the time uh, and even smoked black uh, Sobrani uh, cigarettes. I mean, uh, it, it, it's unimaginably <laughs> pretentious. I, I'm ashamed even tell to me, say. Tell me that beret wasn't involved, please. Uh, there probably was a black <laughs> beret in, in, involved, and I, I directed plays and... Um, uh, uh, and I directed her and made absolutely no impression on her. But uh, two or three years after leaving university, we re-met, um, and, and she took a more charitable view on things, and she became uh, another absolute rock. She was Jewish, um, and I converted to Judaism to marry her. Mm. We were married by somebody who had been through Auschwitz, which is another... Um, the whole... Holocaust is like the First World War, a very important episodes, two crises, uh, which I try and think through, work through in my life. So to be married by him was significant. Um, and called Hugo Grin, a great rabbi. And Joanna was my complete rock. So as you said, Andy, at the beginning, losing her uh, after 34 years of marriage and three wonderful children pulled me apart and in a way put me back in that uh, same position that I'd been in uh, before mm. um, and it was you know, it was difficult I want to talk more about Joanna a, a little a little a little later um, the the sort of passion though for um, mental health in school um, Let's just set a little bit of context because you were so ahead of the curve on this. You know, it was seen, frankly, you know, over a decade ago as, as a bit soft, this idea of talking about happiness, you know, in the context of school. And it certainly wasn't, I remember it from a political perspective, and it certainly wasn't welcomed by all of your colleagues across education by any means. I mean, do you look back at that period as difficult do you remember those moments? I mean, there was a fair bit of personal criticism. How did you sort of feel about that? How did you deal with that? I loved it. I mean, it's so, such a privilege to be criticised, uh, particularly if you think the people... I love are... that. It's a privilege... I'm not even going to say It's a privilege it. to be uh, criticised. Uh, it's, it, it's, it, it's fun, it's exciting. Um, <laughs> and you know, particularly if you, if you be believe that you are on the side of, of what's right. So I, I did come across when I, all my life, I, I've been trying to think, how can we affirm young people? Uh, and whether in schools, whether in plays, or on the sports field, or in lessons, or on trips, um, it's always about building confidence, uh, helping young people to do things that they, uh, didn't think that they could do, doing all night you know, walks uh, in the days when health and safety allowed you to, to, to do that kind of adventure with young people. But it, whatever it was, it was about building self-confidence. But it wasn't until I came across this extraordinary American 
psychologist, Marty Seligman, that, that I realized that you can build capacity. Um, and so it's not happiness it, um, that, that we were doing at Wellington. It was helping build the capacity so that young people could get through crises and adversities that are inevitable in any life um, and come out and not be engulfed by them um, and destroyed because at the heart of that young person or, or person of any age is the ability to prevail, to stay centered, not to catastrophize, not to panic, to hold to what is good, what is true, what is optimistic, what is healthy rather than being uh, engulfed by the, uh, the the catastrophic or the or the disastrous and Seligman, uh, based on the work of people who had been through uh, tragedies, crises, um, could be the Holocaust, uh, could be people in uh, on convoys in the Second World War, trying to understand why when ships went down, some people uh, survived and and others succumbed to the waves, uh, and. At the heart is this notion of resilience. Uh, and he had this great insight that you can teach resilience. Um, that, of course, uh, psychology needs to be about uh, helping things when they have gone disastrously wrong, when they hit the bottom of the waterfall. But it's also about building capacity at the top of the waterfall so that not so many tip over and fall down and hit the bottom. So what can you do to... Uh, reduce the number of those falling off the waterfall and the severity of the crash if and when it happens. And it is about building resilience in young people. And that is what the happiness was all about. In fact, it was the very opposite of being soft. It was, uh, I think, the height of emotional intelligence and compassion and enlightened education. And it helped young people get through results, as I'd point out, uh, gleefully to Michael Gove, David Cameron's education secretary, um, Wellington's results were going up massively quickly at the same time that we were doing this. Mm -hmm. So, you know, it could have been irrelevant what we were doing, but it certainly wasn't destroying what Michael Gove and the Department for Education uh, thought was all important, which were exam results, which are important, but not all important. And so... Uh, that's it. It is about the building of resilience. Uh, Seligman extracted the essence of human psychology and he became interested in, in what goes well. What are the ingredients of successful people, successful relationships um, in, in couples, successful companies, teams? Uh, and rather than obsessing about when management consultants would come in and say, you know, what's going wrong? Uh, tell us about everything that's going wrong or couples therapy, you know, what's wrong with your relationship or an individual seeing somebody, you know, what's gone wrong, starting to ask the question, what's right? So what's right in your relationship? What makes you laugh? Or with the company, you know, when is when is this company or group of people working well? Look at look at teams of uh, in sport. Um, you know, when are the players at their most free and mm. able to be creative and uh, and spontaneous and and you come down to discovering there are habits of resilience that can be learnt um, and which are <laughs> effective uh, and that was why on one level I introduced this person Martin Seligman to Steve Hilton who was David uh, Cameron's uh, head of policies before the 2010 general election you remember I and, do. We shared and, a very small office together. Uh, uh, and he padded around uh, number 10 without his uh, socks, Steve Hilton. But he met and imbibed the whole notion he was interested in it. And out of that, you know, several steps later came the uh, the adoption of uh, well-being targets uh, by the Office of National Statistics and looking at not just quantities, but... You know, figures that give a qualitative view about life um, and you know that's important how good is the quality of this education uh, but also um, how good is the quality of uh, uh, of our experience of living in cities and towns and what can we do to to enhance that quality you know it's important because i'm educating young people at epsom they're unlikely to have the same standards of living as their parents 
first generation where we can say that is likely to be the case. Therefore, we should be helping them to think about the quality of life rather than thinking that happiness will come from uh, getting the latest Mercedes or having a six bedroom house rather than a four bedroom house because they might, you know, have to live in a two bedroom house. All exactly. Uh, exactly. But you can actually be just as happy or indeed happier mm. in a two bedroom house. It must be satisfying that the agenda has changed in line with those, you know, those sort of pioneering moves that you made. But you must also be very concerned that the issue of mental health, you know, anxiety in particular for our young people continues to increase. The statistics are not pretty. Um, I mean, how do you, how do you, at this moment in time, you know, as we, as we stop and, and pause for a second, how would you characterise it? Are we still in a mental health crisis? Is that crisis gathering pace? Or do you feel that, do you feel more positively about it? The, the figures, as you say, are, are not pretty. Now, um, mental health is different to physical health. Uh, we know if somebody has COVID or, or not, uh, or if somebody has cancer or not, we can't in the same way know if somebody is depressed or is suffering from acute anxiety. We can see outward manifestations, self-harm, OCD behaviours, um, withdrawal behaviours, for example. Uh, and so it's much harder to get an, a, an objective picture of where one is. So the, 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 the sad truth is we don't entirely know where we are with the mental health of young people or indeed the nation overall. Neither do we know why the figures are as bad as they are, but clearly COVID, for example, didn't mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. help because of the disruption of patterns uh, at critical times, junctures in people's lives. Mm -hmm. um, and neither do we entirely know what to do about it. But I do know that we can build capacity in young people and need to be doing so in the ways I discussed about building resilience. And it's easier, in the same way it's easier to teach young people Mandarin or French or maths um, while they are young. Look at how easy uh, children find it if parents uh, are from two different, have two different languages to naturally acquire mm -hmm. those, those languages. It's easy to acquire these habits of resilience when we're young. So if we were doing more to build young people's resilience, I think we'd be doing a greater service to them. And by the way, government rightly concerned about figures and spending would be reducing the NHS budget at the moment. We have an NHS that is still absurdly concerned with uh, dealing with problems after they've occurred, physical and mental problems. Yes, yes. Sufficiently That's a... working, uh, at, at, at reducing it. It's not just it, in no. every way we are I not thinking sufficiently. Totally agree. That's another podcast. Yeah. Um, I was looking at some numbers the other day in relation to anxiety with young people, um, numbers that sort of demonstrated a fairly dramatic uptick in anxiety from sort of 2008, uh, not around the time, of course, that the iPhone was introduced. Now, we're not going to pin it on one product, of course, but what's your view of the alignment of technology or the, or the acceleration of technology in our young people's lives to those anxiety levels? Do you see them as closely related, partly related? Do you think that, I mean, obviously technology also brings benefits, mm. makes us more connected, can in some ways be a, a, a huge positive. But those things that we laughingly refer to as phones, but which are those kind of mini computers, generators of resentment, of anxiety, of a life that perhaps is un unattainable. What's your view on the technology piece? So uh, quite simply, we can't, uninvented any more than we can uninvent AI. What we can do is help young people use them as an asset and enrichment uh, and reduce the the damage that it can do. So let's take two examples. Um, they can significantly damage young people's concentration uh, and uh, ability to enjoy uh, the depths uh, of life because of the constant changing and superficial uh, way that, um, that, that, they, that they turn young people's minds and, and reduce their attention span. 
uh, and they can also uh, and do damage the quality of interaction. So, uh, family um, meals together, extraordinarily important, foundational in the development of the young person's sense of uh, family and belonging, uh, something as, as essential uh, as the food that we eat. Um, what's a baby do that from the moment uh, that it's born, it, 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 it craves uh, the warmth and the security of, uh, of the milk from the mother. Uh, we, it's, that's so important, eating is so important. Uh, and if all the family don't eat because they're uh, on their phones or uh, away. So I, I think that you know, we, can, we can mitigate that. In our schools, we can have times where the mobile phones simply aren't uh, there to be used. Um, we can help um, recover the, the contact with nature, with, uh, with uh, each other. Uh, with deep conversation in school uh, and we can uh, ensure that it doesn't compromise uh, the quality of one-to-one -one human contact. You know, uh, we've all learned, haven't we, from COVID that it is not as good uh, being remote as it is face-to-face. -face. There's something about breathing the same air uh, that is foundational in the development of relationships and young people's sense of who they are and their security. So massive problem um, and contributing, one of several factors contributing to the deterioration in young people's mental health could have been addressed, could have been foreseen. Where was the clarity? Um, where was government? Uh, government has often been uh, absent uh, from giving clear advice. It's been concerned with its own short-term targets. It hasn't been, uh, and it's been overly ideological. It hasn't been concerned enough about the deep fabric of the nation, whether it's the environment or the built environment or the fabric of the nation being the, the mental health of mm. our young. But you know, obviously, that there are you know, politicians, some of whom have been in power for quite some time, who hold to the view that it's not government's position to intervene in these things. It's not for government to start telling parents to, you know, tell their kids to use their phone less frequently, to not interfere in families in that way. And now, how do we deal with that one? Um, well, somebody should be doing it, and the whole digital revolution changed what government can and should be doing uh, and uh, I'm naturally in favour of smaller government and helping people to help themselves rather than having an intrusive government. The whole basis of positive psychology is about the building of individual capacity uh, rather than having a big brother or a state telling one what to do and what to think. Uh, but uh, there was clear abrogation of responsibility uh, about giving uh, parents solid advice about how this technology can be deeply corrosive of the formation of um, individual character in young people as they go through uh, critical ages from 11 up to 15, 16, when identity is being formed, mm. uh, where it needs long relationships, deep relationships. Mm. Mm. Um, Complicated story, that one, of course, because in the end, as ever, politics comes down to people in the room, and perhaps some of those people in that room at that time had a different view of technology and could see advantages, let's put it this way, well, I, there are in terms of closer advantages. relationships with, with, with uh, technology. OK, is it so, so the technology, and this is true of AI, which I'm deeply involved with, uh, it, it, it is potentially and has to be the biggest educational boon that we have had for all kinds of reasons we can discuss, but it also could infantilize young people by yes. stripping, you know, let alone cheating and, and other the ability concerns. To learn. Yeah. Yes, it, 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 it can distract. We've seen in London taxi drivers, AI has rendered all their knowledge uh, useless, even mm. worse than useless. So. Uh, I think that that somebody needed to step up um, and uh, I think that government was at the same time driving forward 
um, results, results, results in schools and putting insufficient and indeed um, uh, negativing um, efforts uh, to try uh, uh, those of us who were trying to say it's also about the building of character, the building of judgment, the ability to say, no, I'm not going to look at my iPhone. Yes, we are going to have uh, sacred special time where we're not going to be having the technology. Uh, these efforts were uh, repeatedly um, uh, belittled uh, by government, uh, successive governments, uh, successive education secretaries. Um, and I think enduring damage has been done to the mental health of the nation, which will endure into the 22nd century, because uh, those who were obsessed by exam results at all costs uh, uh, were were dominating at the time. And uh, as I always felt, it was those government ministers who had a child who developed anorexia or um, had a sibling's child who d developed depression who actually begun to think about these things in different ways, away from a mechanical uh, sense about what education was uh, to realising it's much more holistic. And by the way, a child, if you look after that, development of their character and their well-being, they will perform better. Mm -hmm. So in other words, it's not either or, it's win-win. You've written very movingly about the loss of your wife, Joanna. You touched on it earlier. Um, a long, wonderful marriage. Three kids, as you say, who you describe as your greatest achievements. Um, you wrote, in fact, during those years between Joanna's diagnosis and her passing, um, you were incredibly, you know, uh, wonderfully open about what was happening uh, in your lives. Um, you feel strongly um, that it's something that we should do more to bring this subject of grief, you know, out into the open, to talk about it more. My own parents, who uh, I loved very much and did their best, had a taboo. Um, both of them had a lot of death in their own lives. Um, and death was completely taboo. I wasn't, I didn't go to a funeral till I was in my early 30s, didn't go to my grandparents' funerals. And uh, it was something that that w was simply not talked about. I think it's helpful for young people to recognise more about the life cycle. Mm. One reason amongst many, uh, having pets for those who can have pets, is a good thing is that young people can learn that um, puppies um, grow, grow and, and then they, they die, uh, and learning uh, about the, 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 the inevitability of, of death. And I didn't think I was well prepared. I mean, clearly from the moment that you have a terminal diagnosis, you know what how the story is going to end, but somehow you know, but you don't know. And I think it affected me far more than I should have affected me. Um, and um, it's painful, but it's going to happen to all of us. The way that um, Joanna herself handled her diagnosis and the years that followed was, from what I've read, you know, really inspirational. Um, she also clearly had strong views about one how one should live in those circumstances, carry on living in those circumstances, uh, and obviously strong views about about grief. Um, inspirational is the is the right word, I think, isn't it? Yeah, she was totally without self pity. She did have her strong Jewish faith, and uh, she would always. Uh, pray and give gratitude for every new day that she had. Uh, it was difficult. She was often in acute pain over those five years. And um, it, there were some very difficult times and missing key events in our children's lives. Mm. But she always had a, a deep uh, belief in life and a stoicism and a total absence of self pity. Um, she, um, she was very strong. She was never impressed by anyone. She never tried, she never, she never tried to impress anybody and she was never impressed by anybody. She just tried to make the most of every day. It was inspirational, uh, certainly for me and for the children, uh, for those who knew her. 
it's very tough. Everyone will handle that um, announcement by the doctor that they have a life-limiting disease in different ways, um, and uh, we all handle the grief differently. I don't think I did it particularly well, uh, and. Um, Really, why do you why do you say that? Because when I, you know, read what you've written on the subject, when I hear you talking about it here, it's and and about you know the the broader issues of of, of grief and and how we handle you know life's inevitable difficulties as well as the unexpected. You 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 seem to have an a, a total grasp. Well, why why do why do you say you handled it badly? Maybe maybe and certainly I felt that we that. The, the depth of our love was never deeper. I mean, there was just a state of total knowledge. Um, and I remember one morning driving, we'd try where we could to go away for weekends. I was running a school and running a university, but we'd try and go away to the country. She couldn't walk, but she loved being outside uh, from a hotel in a... In a, in a Sussex Downs village called Alfriston, uh, and just feeling this position of utter total knowledge and total unity with her, but um, I think that that I probably felt I could have handled the pain better. But I think the pain is also inevitable. I mean, we all know that pain is the price that we pay for love and if we're going to love anybody there will be deep pain i, I mean there's no way around it uh, they are flip sides of of yes. a coin yes. so um i probably tried to neuter it more by burying myself in work by working harder and harder at school uh, it probably made me quite difficult certainly made me quite difficult um and at the university Again, I wasn't anything like the best I could have been. I probably was too much into, I think, denial was probably the, the, the way I could have handled it better. I should just have been more honest and said to people, look, I actually am finding this pretty difficult. I did tell somebody at the university that, at the very top of the university, and I was finding it very difficult. And I was told, well, I just better get on with it. Um, really? And yes. Really? A total, a total misunderstanding of yeah, the situation? It was a bit, bit harsh I thought yes. uh, but I thought okay that's the so that's what it's like here that's what the, uh, the culture is uh, I wrote about that in a book called Path to Peace just in passing yeah. I, I mean I it's I should have handled it better found a better way of communicating the fact that I was finding it difficult you're being very generous by the sounds of it I think we always there's no what's the point in being anything else um mm. categorically uh while anger is understandable uh, and inevitable it isn't a formula for moving beyond mm. um mm. Uh, there has to be an acceptance and and, and forgiveness um and then one can move on. Some people go to yeah. their graves with uh, the bitternesses simmering away. We should say, of course, that you have found happiness again, thankfully, uh, with your second wife, Sarah. Wonderful in and of itself, but also uh, to have a partner to come home when you're dealing with life's challenges, I'm sure. Um, yeah, I think it's important. I went through, I think you have to go through that process and then be ready. A bit like when one was young and you know, one maybe went straight into a relationship on a rebound uh, and it went wrong. I think it's important to go through that process. And um, Sarah, uh, who I married last year, uh, is um, equally remarkable to Joanna, uh, not the least in inexplicably wanting to marry me and stay with me. Um, and it's new joy and, and new beginnings, uh, fresh opportunities and start and uh, making the most of it. And I feel very blessed. Wonderful. Let's talk about your political writing. Um, brilliant books that properly get under the skin of a government, of a prime minister, in a way that normally only happens many years after they've left, perhaps even many years after they've, you know, they've died. I mean, these books really do... Um, get into the detail of a 
uh, of a uh, you know of a, of a of a period of leadership. Never more so, perhaps, than your book on Boris. You say about him, you know, at his heart, he is extraordinarily empty. That's one of the nicer things you have to say about him. Um, does the fact that he was able to get into number ten and you know, fail so spectacularly, does it speak to a wider crisis of leadership in this country? So, um, by the way, I did not set out to be unfair uh, to him, and I would hope that in that book I was constantly uh, fair to him and trying to find... Uh, positive things that he did and positive things to say mm. about him. Uh, it's not interesting to read any book that sets out to be, I know this, I went into it in this spirit with co-author Raymond Newell to, to try and put a positive construction uh, on it. Um, and I do think that there's a crisis of leadership. Um, so the last truly successful prime minister uh, who changed the dial, uh, left Britain in a much stronger position internally and in the world, uh, changed the agenda of policy and politics, was Margaret Thatcher. And she fell from power in November 1990. Now, uh, in my writing, I identify nine out of the 57 prime ministers who are in that top tier of agenda-changing prime ministers, and we have not had one mm. for 33 years. And uh, there is no immediate sign that Keir Starmer, if indeed he wins, will have the understanding uh, to know and maybe the opportunity um, to know how to change it. So I think there's a crisis of leadership. It's not that then they've been bad people, uh, but successive prime ministerships have underachieved uh, what they themselves set out um, and said that they would do. Tony Blair promised an, an agenda-changing government that would build a new Britain. He transparently didn't do that. And for all the several or many perhaps good things that he did do, he also took Britain into a wholly unnecessary war in Iraq, which has damaged Britain uh, and its standing uh, in the world, not to say the um, all those lives lost. So it uh, it's hard to say that we don't have a crisis of premiership at the moment. Now, that really interests me and in what you can do about it. Um, and uh, part, we know this because of all the uh, under... Um, resolve problems that, that a government with grip would be sorting out and they prove that they in, include productivity, uh, crumbling infrastructure, ha housing, inadequate housing stock, at the NHS, which is uh, absolutely not fit uh, for purpose. We don't have whatever uh, we may think of Brexit. There has not been a coherent plan uh, to uh, ensure that the country uh, benefited uh, from Brexit. Uh, I think education, as described, so we needn't go back over that, um, needs to be significantly rebalanced in the direction that we've said. Um, so look at, you can ask yourself, what long-term issues has the government resolved? Uh, now, uh, if we look at government, say, in Japan, um, uh, or other governments in the Far East, uh, there is a, a greater concern for the long term beyond the life of the government. The truth is that every prime minister, or when they come to the door of Downing Street, they will say fine, emotional, tear-watering uh, words on, on the front steps about quoting from St. Francis with Margaret Thatcher, their ambitions for the country when they come in to the front door, they have one objective in mind, which is to win a general election. It's to stay there. Short yeah. term. Stay there, short term. And what about the nation? Uh, what about the fact that, in effect, they've become head of state, taking over from the monarch? Um, but who is actually looking after the long term? Big problem, big crisis. Do you, when you've been in and around politics for a long time, do you think we've had any near misses 
on the leadership front. Is there anyone that you would say, oh, I wish they'd been given a go? They might have been. They might have done a better job. Well, I don't actually think there have been some great books by Steve Richards and others on this topic. I don't think any of them would have done better. I think the the eight people who've stepped up to the mark, um, and some of them have done much better than others, um, uh, had the qualities. I mean, the people, three people perhaps, who had the, the, the qualities better than others. Uh, John Major, who I think was vastly underrated, uh, Tony Blair, David Cameron, uh, had the skills to be a great prime minister. But as Tony Blair says, if he knew what he knows now, he would have been a much better prime minister. Well, sorry, chum, you had the opportunity. Mm. Not being, you know, knowing so little. Um, what other organisation promotes people who know so little and who have so little interest in learning how to do the job? Um, and who boot out from helping them, those people who actually can help them, mm. to replace them by know-nothings. Of the prime ministers you've studied and written about, who was the best equipped for crisis? Oh, uh, I think that... Um, uh, I think that Cameron, uh, because of his optimistic uh, nature... Uh, which uh, and his sense of balance and, and proportion. Now, to some people, that was a um, uh, sign of an almost flippant um, Harold Macmillan mm. sense that um, uh, of of of, uh, of underly dramatizing because he wouldn't get uh, extraordinarily wound up as some prime ministers have done. But exactly the same skills we talked about at the beginning of the podcast about um, you know, taking a deep breath, uh, not losing your head, uh, thinking things through deeply, keeping a sense of proportion, a sense of humour. Uh, all these things are important in a, in a crisis. Um, and, One would uh, say, though, and, and, you know, we both know him, uh, and, and I agree with that summary, but one would also point out that the crisis radar perhaps wasn't too finely tuned when one looks at what led to his departure. And that is a crisis skill, right? It is not just about management, it is about the early warning system. Uh, it was, I think he had to call, this is David Cameron, the, he had to call the referendum in June 2016. I think the pressure within the country and the expectation uh, would have main, made it very difficult uh, not to have called a referendum given the nation was so deeply divided and given that politicians of themselves hadn't come up with a acceptable way that mm. Britain could live at peace with the EU. But do you think he had to the resign? Way he fought it, I think the way he fought it was simply naive yes. uh, and, and wrong. Um, yes. And having lost, do you think he was right to resign? Because I, I hold the view, and whenever I offer it, tumbleweed normally blows through the room, that I didn't think he, he should have resigned. I used to organise talks in in uh, number ten history. None of them history is is we have chief economists, chief statisticians, chief medical officers, chief yes, scientists. Yes. Well, for goodness sake, is the chief historian. Yes. So it was a privilege to to under the great Jeremy Hayward and uh, to, to 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 start bringing in a series of historians to talk. Mind you, the most important people in the room often didn't come and attend the talks. But one talk was given by Vernon Bogdanor, um, who taught. David Cameron at um, Oxford, uh, taught in politics, and he talked about the 1975 referendum and how the Prime Minister there, Harold Wilson, stayed apart. I think had David Cameron fought it differently, uh, he probably, I don't know, uh, haven't asked him, uh, might think this himself, had he thought it differently, uh, he could have stayed above the ring more. He felt he had to be so partisan. I think having declared his allegiance so much, I think it would have been difficult for him to stay on given the extraordinary and enduring bitterness that we saw froth up uh, to the surface thereafter. Difficult for sure, but the question was not about David Cameron. The question was not about whether or not David Cameron should or shouldn't be promised. There needed to have been more thought and more work, more awareness of, uh, of the rest of the country, uh, the alienation of the rest of the country from uh, Westminster and Whitehall. Uh, it, it was a, a failure, a multiple failure of government 
from a government based in the southeast of this country with a prevailingly southeast mentality to recognize how the rest of the country felt. Was it about uh, rejecting the EU? Was it about rejecting a government that was uh, uh, that, that had was constantly supportive of the EU in favor of a new hope, a new hope, a new promise for a Britain alone that uh, was not offered by successive governments uh, with a plan to, it's a perfectly good case for Brexit, but it wasn't uh, coherently produced by uh, government. So um, uh, that is one uh, uh, of a series of difficulties that the Conservative governments have had since 2010. The uh, enduring impact of the global financial crisis was another one, and obviously uh, the impact of uh, the greatest epidemic to hit the country since the Spanish flu after the First World War uh, is yet another. There are a series of exogenous shocks that uh, have hit the government, the war in Ukraine and the subsequent price rises, uh, yet another, and the whole AI revolution and destabilization uh, of that. But you know, government should be better at horizon scanning. Government is far, number 10 is far too focused cabinet office, which has got bigger and bigger, but less and less efficient. Um, the, the, it's a mess and, uh, uh, and it will not serve uh, Keir Starmer unless at uh, the center of government, as we're working on at the Institute for Government, um, uh, if they don't follow the, the recommendations that we're going to be making about how to run a, a rational centre of government based on what works best in the world in other centres of government. No, I know as it's coming across I think in this conversation this is something you feel very passionately about and, and uh, uh, focusing a lot of your time and effort on. Just a final political question, we're heading you know, towards an election, we don't know exactly when it will be but um, next year obviously. The, the issue of um, fee-paying schools looks like it's going to be weaponised, it's going to become a campaigning issue. Are you concerned about how that might play out? So uh, I think that it's a, a very easy, convenient policy for Keir Starmer. It ticks lots of boxes. Um, it uh, appeals strongly to his uh, left wing. It shows that uh, Keir hasn't gone, uh, uh, hasn't gone uh, Blairite um, and that he's still one of us. Um, but is it the right solution to in the independent school issue in Britain? Wherever do you, uh, does a, a whole system uh, benefit when you uh, damage and destroy uh, the most successful and, and creative parts of it? Now, of course, a lot of state schools are better than independent schools, without a shadow of doubt. The, the state sector has got better and better over the last... Uh, 20 years without a shadow of doubt. Uh, but independent schools, um, that, that if you put too much the squeeze on them, uh, the ones that will go down will be those in less affluent areas where the parents are less affluent. The strong uh, will continue. I think there are more imaginative and better ways to uh, get the best out of uh, independent schools and to help them enrich the whole culture uh, of uh, the state education system uh, than putting uh, than having um, policies which will uh, which will damage them uh, significantly. So I think he's uh, uh, something needs to be done, but I think it's uh, politically driven rather than educationally or thinking of the long term fabric uh, of the country. Uh, Anthony, thank you so much for your time today. Uh, I'm going to ask you, as we do with all our guests, to give us your three crisis comforts. Uh, the three um, three things can't be another person, I'm afraid, that you lean on during those more challenging moments. Uh, you've mentioned meditation already, so I'm not, I'm afraid, going to let you have that one. Um, but 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 three other sort of practical. Um, uh, crisis comforts that come to mind? Okay, uh, walking. Um, uh, walking is sensational. Um, I, I adore it. I'm uh, walking now from Switzerland to, well, not literally now, uh, to Auschwitz uh, for a, a, a new uh, book. Uh, second, um, just... Do you write as you walk, can I ask? Yeah, I do. Hey, I, I, I do. Uh, so that book um, called The Path to Peace, Walking a Thousand Kilometers Along the Western Front Way and helping create that million steps through soil where 10 million had become casualties, 
I'm got my phone out. Sorry, Andy, I got my phone out there, but I'm productively, uh, and and I'm just dictating into it uh, things that um, I'm seeing and noticing in in. You know, another age, I would have had my um, a pencil and, and a pad in my pocket. So, um, and then when I get back in the evening at the end of a day's walking, I will put all that together. Um, you know, secondly, there's nothing surely more heavenly and grounding than being in France uh, by a river, having lunch with people. Oh, no names. Uh, one uh, loves um, and uh, just feeling. Uh, having gone for a long walk, just feeling the glow and uh, and warmth of uh, the food uh, that's grown in the soil and the wine that's grown in the soil that one is in. Uh, and uh, finally, of all, oh, goodness, I, I mean, you know, teaching uh, and teaching, you know, being back in the classroom mm. uh, with kids because this is the most peculiar thing of all, it's in teaching that we learn. So I'm always saying to the young people, your best teachers are each other. And the more you can try and explain things to each other, you'll understand things much better. So, uh, you know, GCSE A level, you know, working groups with each other, or indeed finals. Um, and so I just adore having a group. I mean, I mean, it, it's, it's unbelievably privileged talking to young people um, and sharing ideas with them. Uh, I, I, I mean, the happiness, Geiger counter just is is in crisis because it's getting bent because it's totally off uh, the scale of happiness. Wonderful. Sir Anthony Seldon, thank you for such a um, helpful, uh, insightful, uh, I think, um, generous conversation. Very much appreciated. It's been great to see you. Thank you, Andy. If you've enjoyed this episode, please do give us a rating and a review. It really helps. And if you hit subscribe, wherever you download your podcast from, you'll find loads more useful crisis conversations. You can follow us on Instagram and TikTok, and you can watch the full episodes on YouTube. Just search for Crisis What Crisis Podcast. You can also find full transcripts of this and every episode on our website, crisiswhatcrisis.com. Thanks again for joining us.